Amen. Well, we've, I guess, somewhat provocatively titled this session, Temple to the Tree of Knowledge, Worshiping Man in Science and Education. And in many ways, it's a sort of a continuation of what Brother Howard just presented. But I guess I'll start by saying that uh, the, the, the perspectives and, and uh, viewpoints that I'll be sharing are not ones that originated with me. They're all covered uh, in a book that we have there in the back called The Coerced Mind. Uh, much more thoroughly, eloquently, and potentially more accurately than I'm going to cover here today. I hope not, but uh, uh, if, there's any, if I say anything wrong, it's just because I, I uh, misread the book or because Brother Howard misinformed me. But. <laughs> Well, are we, do we have sufficient grace for another demolition session? Yes. Okay. I, uh, my family joined the community about nine years ago, and one of the things that excited me about it was that I had absolutely no handy skills. I couldn't work with my hands. I wasn't a craftsman. I couldn't build anything. And so I was excited at the prospect of, of learning how to do that, and, and I saw all the incredible craftsmanship. And so pretty early on, when I was invited to my first uh, construction project, it was the, the addition that we did on the cafe up here, I got pretty excited. I thought, I'm finally going to find a place here in the, in the kingdom and everything. And I showed up, and a young brother pointed me, handed me a crowbar and a hammer, and he pointed to this wall. He said, yeah, just, just tear it down. I said, just start. He said, yeah, you can't mess it up. Just tear it down. <laughs> and in, in some form or fashion, I guess I've, that's, I've kind of, that's continued on. That's been a recurring theme uh, <laughs> as I've found my way into different places. Uh, I continue to specialize in demolition. So. T today's wall is called state-sponsored education, and so if anybody's got a, a hammer and a crowbar, we can get started. Uh, but, but seriously, it, it, the topic of education is one that probably most of us, if not all of us, are very passionate about, certainly those of us that have children. Uh, as you saw in the video, we, uh, our general pattern here for about the last 45 years or so has been to educate within the context of primarily the home and in the community. And our reasons for doing that are, are primarily positive uh, as opposed to a reaction to something negative. And we have uh, actually books about that too if you're interested in our philosophy uh, of Christian education, Wisdom's Children. Um, I personally was not raised in the community and so I actually uh, spent 13 years in uh, public school and went to a state university. And uh, I just want to say by saying that, that we do not judge those that have views other than us in this, in this uh, area. Some of our closest friends are educators. Um, some of the best times that we have are when we host classes from the local university. Uh, several times a week we have schools come out for field trips and uh, I, we absolutely do not, do not judge those people. Um, and I think that what my intention is here today is certainly not to offend anyone, but uh, what I want to suggest or, or expose rather is what I believe to be the faulty foundation of a structure that is growing increasingly hazardous to the spiritual lives of believers. And, and that's really what, what my focus is going to be. Uh, I know there are many well-intentioned people within that, and I, I appreciate all that they've done. There's some that even given their lives to it, and I'm not directing this at them. But uh, it's, it's not my intention to talk about some of the academic failures of these forms of education, although a lot could be said about that. Uh, it's not my intention to get into the $1.9 trillion in student debt, the student debt crisis, although a lot could be said about that as well. But what I want to hopefully uh, demonstrate is that when it comes to the explicit goals and underlying objectives 
of those that formulated the modern system for secular education that it's actually been a smashing success. And uh, Jesus said, beware of false prophets that come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And he says that you'll know them by their fruit. And if a fairly recent study by LifeWay Christian Research Group is any indication, uh, the fruit, uh, particularly of modern academia, should be pretty troubling to us as believers. Uh, I believe the study said that of uh, children who are raised in a a church-going, Bible-believing home, that by the time they finish college, 66% of them will have walked away from the faith. Full two-thirds. And so that's something that ought to trouble us as believers. Uh, And and I guess the question that I'm wanting to answer is, did something go, go terribly wrong? Did something go terribly amiss? Or has this been the plan from the beginning? And so what I'd like to really just do is, is tell a story. Uh, and it's a, uh, unfortunately, it is a true story, and it's a tragic story. Um, I think the best place to begin the story is probably where many of us have begun. Uh, you may be aware that religious historians and, and mythologists agree that nearly every ancient religion uh, has a, what they call a tree motif. And so uh, in all of these ancient religions, there's, they feature a, a tree at the center of a garden. Um, all things spiritually and culturally revolve around this tree. Uh, they feature a serpent in many cases and a, a promise of a kind of enlightenment for those that would partake uh, of the fruit of that tree. And with all but one exception, that enlightenment that comes from the partaking of that fruit is depicted as something altogether positive. Uh, the one exception being, of course, the Old Testament. And we've, we've, we've talked some about the, uh, the, how Genesis depicts that situation. Uh, God put man and woman in a garden. In the midst of the garden, there were many trees. Uh, they were given free reign to eat of all of the trees of the field except for one, and that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, but the serpent, it says, was more cunning than any, sorry, I'm gonna, I've got a remote control, I'm gonna do some slides here to try to keep people awake. <laughs> and I completely forgot about it, okay. You there, okay. So the way Genesis depicts it, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, and he came with this temptation. Now, I think what's, what's interesting about this is that the devil didn't just come with a set of alternative facts to what God had presented. He didn't just come and say, well, actually, it's this way. But he came with a certain kind of appeal. He came and, and, and cast uh, the woman in, in kind of a, of a victim role of sorts. You know, he, he knows that if you partake of this, that your eyes will be opened and you'll be able to know for yourself. One, one version says, determining for yourself good and evil. And so it was an appeal to the inherent desire in human nature to exalt itself to the place of God. And yet we know, and as I hope to demonstrate, that ultimately Satan's objective was not merely for man to exalt himself to the place of God, but that he himself would be worshipped, that he himself would be like the Most High. Uh, The scriptures, they told me my phone would not go to sleep if I used it as a remote, but it is. Let's see. The, uh, do you guys want to bring, do you want to bring me a remote? Would that, would that work better than this? The scriptures point out that this deception that began in the garden is one that just began there, but it actually continued on in increasing measure throughout history in in slightly more subtle ways. Uh, Ezekiel 
God addresses Satan by saying, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. To which of the trees in Eden will you then be likened in glory and greatness? Yet you shall be brought down with the trees of Eden to the depths of the earth, and you shall lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and his multitude. Earlier in Ezekiel, it actually refers to Assyria as one of the the trees in, in, in Eden. So what is he saying here? It seems kind of confusing at first, doesn't it, when you see it? What is, he, what, is, what is he saying? How could Satan be said to be a tree, uh, a king, and a nation? Sorry. Uh, what, is, what is he saying there? And I, I think what he's saying is that Behind some of these human faces are supernatural powers that are operating on the basis of this same deception that the serpent offered up in the garden. In other words, it's this same enticement towards man exalting himself to the place of God that's just taking these different forms. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, Thank you. Brother Howard mentioned earlier about Pergamum. And I think one of the significant things there was that it was both the center of state worship, of worship of the the, uh, imperial cult, and it was also the academic center of the ancient world. And uh, he quoted the historian that, that mentioned that, and I won't give the whole quote, but there's Pergamum. I won't give the whole quote, but he says that science and literature became an attribute for the power and the glory of the state. And so somehow academics paved the way for the state to be glorified in Pergamum. And then he goes on to say that along with Alexandria, it was the prototype of Oxford and Cambridge, the prototype of the modern university. And then he mentions that Uh, The humanistic scholarship uh, there inspired an attitude that makes human consciousness the alpha and omega. Man is the measure of all things and the individual is a center of values. And so even in that, we can see that the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has, has, has come to bloom in Pergamum there as well. So shortly after Satan's throne was established in Pergamum, uh, the God of heaven and earth, as we know, robed himself in human flesh and came and dwelt among us. And as we've already heard, it was his purpose uh, through his own self-sacrificial death and the pouring out of his spirit to establish a complete alternative to this kind of system that is being described here. A place where man could, could enter back in to that relationship with God that he had in the garden as someone who is subject to God, someone who's in subordination to the knowledge of God and whose life is centered in God. There was a place where we could crawl off of the throne of our own lives and put the Lord back on the throne. And we know that in some sense, the ruler of this world, who has been identified as the same serpent, was cast out. He wasn't cast out of the whole world, but he was cast out of of this spiritual kingdom that Jesus was coming to establish for those that were participants in that kingdom. And for quite a while, uh, this kingdom that was growing on the earth restrained the workings of the serpent. Uh, It had a restraining power. He was unable to deceive the nations to the same extent that he once had because of the influence of the church and turning the world upside down. And yet, as we've also heard, pretty soon events began to transpire that would lead to a rebirth of this man-centered form of knowledge in the form of the uh, Renaissance of the 16th century and the uh, Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries. The, The word Renaissance just simply means rebirth. And so in these events, we had a a rebirth 
of this human-centered way of knowledge and that wound that the Lord dealt to the serpent began to be healed and that old tree began to bear fruit once again. Now, if we, uh, before I, go, I move on, uh, Peter Gay, who was an histor- historian of the Enlightenment, pro- probably one of the foremost historians of the Enlightenment and a proponent of the Enlightenment, described the philosophy of the Enlightenment as man is and must be the center of all things. And so we're going to see a recurring theme here, okay? Uh, if, if we were to look up, I mean, you could look it up on Wikipedia, on Google. If you look up the history of compulsory education, you're going to see the same names appear. You're going to see names like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who's been mentioned. Uh, you're going to see the, the Prussian uh, educational model as being influential. Um, you're going to see Frederick the Great. You're going to see uh, German philosophers like Hegel. You're going to see American educators like Horace Mann and, and uh, John Dewey. Uh, and what I'm going to hope to show here is that in the philosophies of each of these men, you're going to see a recurring theme of this deception towards man's worship of himself. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is the Enlightenment, and Brother Howard has already talked some about Rousseau. Rousseau was one of the uh, chief uh, Enlightenment philosophers. Uh, he was a Genevan, mid-18th century, and he's really known for a couple of things. Uh, one thing he's known for, as Brother Howard mentioned, is for being the father of the modern secular model of education. Uh, the other thing he's known for is for being the ideological and philosophical architect of the French Revolution and the reign of terror that resulted in the, the deaths of 50,000 French citizens, half of them by the guillotine. And so what we see in the French Revolution is the, the embodiment and the expression of the ideas of Rousseau and his philosophy. And so it's, it's worth noting that this is, this is the father of modern education. Uh, one historian described Rousseau as unhappy, self-pitying, and exceptionally self-centered. That seems a bit at first like an odd way to describe somebody who must have cared so much about the, the education of children that he devised this philosophy. Um, what was the motives of such a selfish man to, to come up with such a philosophy? Well, Rousseau did have five children of his own. Uh, unfortunately, history doesn't record anything about these children because no sooner were each one of them born that he had his mistress deposit them at a notorious uh, orphanage. I can't pronounce the, the name in, in French, but in English, I believe it translates to Hospital for Found Children. And it seems like a warm place to, to raise a child, doesn't it? Uh, while history doesn't tell us anything about his children, it does tell us something about this orphanage. Uh, what it says is that two-thirds of the babies that were delivered to this place died in their first year of life. Of the ones that survived, 14 in every 100 went on to the age of seven. And of those, only five grew to maturity. So five out of 100 children even saw adulthood. And the ones that grew to maturity, most of them became beggars. And so the the father of the modern model for secular education that is the predominant model still in the West condemned all of his children to disease, beggary, and death. And when his actions became known, he devised... The most, one of the most thorough and, and uh, clever justifications for his transgression in history, and it was called Emile, a treatise on education, and it is the blueprint for the modern model of education. And 
what he does, he draws from Plato. So Plato was really uh, one of the ones that first conceptualized the model for compulsory education, at least the Western model. And in Plato's Republic, he was, his interest was in an ideal state, that state with a capital S. Uh, and so this was a, a, a model, a blueprint of philosophy for an ideal state. And what he said is that an ideal state is going to require ideal citizens that will be made ideal citizens through an ideal form of education. And so simply put, that was, that was what Plato, Plato's philosophy of education was. And Rousseau drew from that and uh, created a blueprint for what that ideal education would look like. And he said that one of the, the, the main, fa the, the, one of the main uh, aspects of that is going to have to be the removal of children from their families to be abstracted from the outside world for years. And so that, that was something that was going to absolutely be required in order to create the ideal citizen. And so through this justification, suddenly he doesn't have to take responsibility for what he's done because in handing his children over to the state, they were really theirs in the first place. They belonged to the state in the first place. And so the, the orphanage became a metaphor for the state. Uh, in terms of his philosophy, Brother Howard has touched on this, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but uh, he had a lot different view, as, as he mentioned, of human nature than uh, most of us would and than the Bible does. He didn't see man as being born in sin and shapen in iniquity. He saw human nature as being inherently good. Now, he would have defined good a lot different than most of us would have defined good. Uh, but the way he saw it, the problem wasn't sin. Man was born good, and the problem was society. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, he never was really able to articulate it in a way that made sense either. But what he's essentially saying is that somehow or another, uh, a society of inherently good individuals corrupted those inherently good individuals. And so, uh, and, and I, I'm going to try to, to vast, vastly summarize and simplify some of these philosophies. Th these guys are not known for the clarity of their prose. <laughs> okay, they're, they're, they're quite obscure. And so I apologize if I'm, if I'm uh, uh, being unfair to any of these representations, but I think we've got some quotes that'll, that'll make, it, make it clear that I'm not too far off the mark, okay? But so, so he, he envisioned this, uh, that, that human nature was inherently good and that society was the problem. And one thing that's kind of deceiving about a lot of these philosophers is that they do seem to give some place to God, right? You'll, you'll read in their, you know, they're, they're not openly, in many cases, coming against God, but it's a different God than you and I understand as being God. You know, Rousseau didn't have a problem with the God of civil religion. He didn't have a problem with the God that would, that would take his, his place in the corner in, in subordination to the God of the state. He didn't have a problem with that God. But he absolutely had a problem with Yahweh. He had a problem with the Judeo-Christian God. And uh, it was, it was this, this Judeo-Christian moral ethic, this, this God that would say, uh, my ways are higher than yours and my thoughts are higher than yours. You know? It's the God that would say, uh, if you love me, obey my commands. Uh, it, it was a God that would say, uh, those who do not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God will abide upon them. You know, that, these are things that would have been anathema to Rousseau. And so it was, the, it was the, these kinds of ideas in his mind that corrupted mankind. And so what needed to happen was that somehow we needed to, to, to break people loose of their allegiances to this God and this, this system of moral ethics, release them from that, and educate them towards this new ethic, okay? And that through doing that, we would bring about, in, in, in his mind, uh, a kind of golden age utopia. And uh, I think it's appropriate, certainly in this case, to point out that the, the literal meaning of the word utopia is no place. And you'll, you'll reckon, those of you who are familiar with critical theory, the Frankfurt School, all this stuff that's happening now, 
um, is all rooted in this, this same philosophy that I've just described. Even Freud on some level was, was based in that. Um, and, and Rousseau made his intentions very, very clear. And so I've got some, some quotes here I want to share with you. Uh, he said, those who control a people's opinions control its actions, and such control is established by treating citizens from infancy as children of the state. Now, there's been an ongoing debate about education and whether it's about control or whether it's about quality. And uh, for whatever it's worth, the person who devised the philosophy for modern education seems to think it's about control. He used the word control three times in that, in that sentence. Uh, he goes on and says that children should be trained to consider themselves only in the relationship to the body of the state. For being nothing except by the state, they will be nothing except for it. It will have all they have and will be all they are. And so the purpose is not for people to be conformed into the image of Christ. It's for them to be conformed into the image of the state, to be absorbed into this, this counterfeit system that poses itself as, as, as kind of a, an alternative body of Christ. Uh, he goes on, let's see, do I have this one? Yeah. Education is crucial, for it is education that must give souls their national form and so direct their opinions and their tastes that they will be patriots by inclination, passion, and necessity. And he goes on to advise any future tyrants that would want to apply this model of education. Uh, create citizens, and you have everything you need. To form citizens is not the work of a day, and in order to have men, it is necessary to educate them when they are children. Children must be influenced rather early to regard their individuality only in its relation to the body of the state and to be aware, so to speak, of their own existence merely as a part of that state. Does that leave any question about what his intentions were with his model of education? This is the prevailing model of education. Uh, educators today, they don't all feel the way about Rousseau like we do. And so you'll find that, that, that even many modern educators are very fa speak very favorably about Rousseau in this. Even mild say too modeled all of his communist education explicitly after Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Amen. Amen. Uh, it seems like that those of us that are hearing about his intention with education, we would, we would identify that as more indoctrination than education, wouldn't we? But I think that Rousseau actually was dead on because he understood, like has already been said, that the true meaning of the word education is to lead out. And that's been his intention from the very beginning, is to lead people out of a worldview and a perspective that is centered on God and into a man-centered perspective. That's been his intention from the beginning. And he said that uh, there were two primary obstacles to his system of education taking hold. There were two things. If anything was going to stand in the way, there were going to be two things that stood in the way. And so we had to be mindful of these things. Uh, and it's probably not going to surprise you what they were, but it is, it is quite telling. Uh, the first one was the father. So this modern system of education could be hindered by fathers. He said that state educators must not abandon to the intelligence and prejudices of fathers the education of their children. As that education is of still greater importance to the state than it is to the fathers. These are direct quotes. He says, families dissolve, but the state remains. Is this not a state that has been put in the place of God? It's the state that's immortal. Uh, and he goes on to be even more explicit. The public authority takes the place of the father. It's almost as if he was trying to use education to create an alternative to the body of Christ. This, before Rousseau's philosophy could actually take hold in the French Revolution, it actually became pretty popular about 500 miles west in Germany, in Prussia. 
And uh, anybody who is familiar with, uh, I think I'm on the right slide, anybody who's looked into the history of compulsory education will know that the Prussian model of education was the model that, that primarily influenced the American model of education. That's even evidenced in, in the word kindergarten. It's a, it's a German word. And so um, Prussia was really the first uh, state system to really employ this enlightenment model of education to create loyal citizens to the state. Um, something that's, that's maybe worth just a, a, a brief aside here, some of the first proponents of, of compulsory education in, in Germany actually were not people who were uh, sympathetic to the Enlightenment, but it was actually Christians. Uh, well-intentioned, seemingly sincere Christians. And they saw uh, state-sponsored compulsory education as a means to advance the gospel and to carry forward uh, and to perpetuate a traditional Christian worldview. Uh, even Martin Luther went as far as to say that using a system like that, we could wage war with the devil. And it's pretty difficult in hindsight to imagine a more short-sighted plan than that. Uh, if we're going to wage war with the devil, we better fight with weapons that are not his weapons. And uh, it's a little bit like trying to fight fire with gasoline. But uh, uh, what they didn't see is the danger of a system like this falling into the wrong hands. And that's exactly what happened. It couldn't have fallen into any worse hands than Frederick the Great. And again, he's acknowledged as being the person who really instituted this revolutionary model of compulsory education in Germany that would go on to influence the American model. And Frederick was a real character. Uh, I thought I had a picture of him here. Oh, I skipped ahead here. Well, uh, Frederick was absolutely obsessed with the Enlightenment. He was, uh, oh, there you go. They're, 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 they're helping me out here. <laughs> they, they told me earlier, if I was challenged te technologically, that I could just pretend to do this, and they would pick up on it, and they would advance the slides. And everything, so... so. Uh, I, I tried to pick very flattering photos of these pe <laughs> people. That, yeah. uh, he was quite a character. Um, he, he was obsessed with the Enlightenment, particularly with uh, Voltaire, who uh, was another, along with Rousseau, another one of the chief philosophers of the Enlightenment. Um, Voltaire, it, so th their relationship, Frederick and Voltaire, has been best described as a love affair. Their, their letters to one another read like love letters. I mean, they were ab he was absolutely obsessed with them. And uh, it's just worth noting that it was, you know, Voltaire was probably the most influential person in Frederick's life. And Voltaire absolutely despised Christianity. Can you guys pull the Voltaire quote up? Do I? There we go. He said, every sensible man, every honorable man must hold the Christian sect in horror. It's the most ridiculous, absurd, bloody religion that has ever infected the world. Now, I might be accused in some of these instances of putting words in people's mouth or mischaracterizing their positions, but it'd be pretty hard to mischaracterize this, wouldn't it? Uh, and then he goes on from there, and, and uh, this is a... <laughs> Uh, he speaks of the Jews. Now, his main problem with the Jews was that it was from the Jews that came Christianity. But uh, he said that the Jews are the greatest scoundrels who have ever sullied the face of the globe. They are all of them born with raging fanaticism in their hearts. I would not in the least be surprised if these people would not someday become deadly to the human race. You Jews have surpassed all nations in impertinent fables, in bad conduct, and in barbarism, and you deserve to be punished, for this is your destiny. And we're going to follow this through, and we're going to see how this, these ideas led to one of the worst atrocities in human history. Um, it was under Voltaire's tutelage 
that Frederick became a legend throughout Germany. He became a, a legendary military leader. Um, and, and largely that was because he learned to employ the enlightenment methods for controlling uh, public opinion, uh, namely education. And uh, he wasn't any more sympathetic to Christianity or Judaism than his, uh, his teacher, Voltaire, was. He called uh, Christian communion the climax of madness and insanity. And then he said of the Jews, we have too many Jews in the towns. They are less than human. I have never persecuted anyone from this or any other sect. I think, however, it would be prudent to pay attention so that their numbers do not increase. And his number one admirer 200 years later would put this into practice. Why, how is all this relevant to education? As I said, Frederick was the one who is known for instituting this revolutionary model of education that would go on to take hold uh, in, in the West and, and, and namely in America. Um, I want to just say a few things uh, before we move on about the German Enlightenment because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's key here too. And I want to show you how, how the serpent played a little bit of a sleight of hand here. So the German Enlightenment produced some of the most influential philosophers in history. Uh, I think it was said that one of them, Immanuel Kant, uh, his death was what brought the end of the Enlightenment. And so, so Kant was one of these that would, he would allow for there to be God and everything. But he said that human, the human mind and human reason was the sole arbiter and criterion of truth. And so, uh, you know, while maybe God does exist, that the way that man would come to the knowledge of God was through the use of reason. And so it was kind of a rationalist faith. And that, that really is, is kind of the starting place of the serpent in the garden. Really where he was starting was is that, you know, you, you can discern for yourself good and evil. But you can see how that, that really shifts man, man's position in relation to God. You know, instead of being under God, instead of being subject to God, suddenly the mind of man is exalted and comes to know God through its own observation and, and analytical skills, its own reason. Okay? Now, Hegel, who we heard earlier influenced uh, Karl Marx, would take that one step further and complete that, that, that trick of the serpent. So he would go on to say that it wasn't just that reason was the sole arbiter of truth, but that the human mind collectively was God. Okay, the human mind was, was God recreating the world in its, his own image. And so, and, and really that naturally does follow. And now we're starting to see what the, the serpent's intentions were in the garden. He wasn't just trying to separate man from, from God. He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be worshipped. And so, in Hegel, we can kind of see that shift start to take place where the state, you know, if man is separated from God and each one is an isolated individual and human reason uh, is divine, then the corporate embodiment of human intellect and reason is the state. The state is that binding force that stands in the place of God. And he said this explicitly. It, it was the, he called it, the, it was the Weltgeist, the world spirit, was this God. And this is Kant and Hegel. Uh, Hegel said specifically, we must hence honor the state as the divine upon the earth. So he, he made that shift complete. And he said that the, the, uh, the state is the march of God in the world. Lest we confuse his intentions, uh, he made his philosophy uh, explicit when he said that it would be ridiculous to believe that the state's specific function 
consisted in protecting and securing everyone's life and property. So those of you that, that thought that that was part of the state's role, that, that's a ridiculous notion, according to Hegel. Okay? What it actually is, the rational end of man is life in the state. Since the state is mind objectified, which is also God, according to Hegel, it is only as one of its members that the individual himself has objectivity, genuine individuality, and an ethical life. And so this is, this is just Rousseau being expressed again. We can see the same, uh, the same concepts being carried forward here, but in increasing measure. Uh, like Rousseau, Hegel was particularly scornful of any who, in his words, would seek guidance <clears throat> from the Lord. He said, the only possible fruit of those that would seek guidance from the Lord, the only fruit of their attitude is folly, abomination, and the demolition of the whole ethical order. And so because the state has become God, then seeking the Lord becomes an act of abomination against the true God. And this ethical order that must be very different than the Judeo-Christian ethical order. Are you following? I know this is, these are relatively dense topics, but uh, this, this really became, Hegel's philosophy became the official faith of the German intelligentsia. And, and it was Hegel's philosophy and this German model of education that would go on to, to really shape and be formative in the American model of education. So just going over to America briefly, you know, originally the colonists were very opposed to this educational system that was starting to take place in Europe and in Germany because they had just come from England and they didn't want the state to have anything to do with their education. They saw education as being an expression of religion. And they believed that God had given parents the primary responsibility for educating their children and that, that education was supposed to take place in the context of the home and the local community. Um, and this was the predominant view until about around the beginning of the 1800s. And uh, what happened there in the beginning of the 1800s, to pick up on Brother Howard's theme of apostasy, uh, a group of, of people who were influenced by uh, this enlightenment perspective of man as God uh, began to really take positions of prominence within the American educational system. And they've been referred to as apostates from the voluntary uh, model of Christian education and these people were called the Unitarians. And uh, even their spokesperson, they, they, were, they had a radically secular uh, worldview. They denied the deity of Christ. They denied the notion of original sin. Um, and even their spokesperson, George Marshall, said that Unitarians' modern movement was actually born out of the Enlightenment. And so around the 1800, early 1800s, the Enlightenment came to America and began to change the, the, the educational landscape. Uh, in, in 1805, when the Unitarians took over control of Harvard, it was known and still is by many as the most uh, significant event in the history of American education because it changed the entire shape. It changed the entire landscape of American education. And... Uh, it was Unitarians uh, in Massachusetts that went on to establish the first school board. Horace Mann was the head of the school board there. Um, and pretty soon it just, it just it began to take hold first in, in New England, and then it just it kind of went forward from there. But um, in case anybody is under the confusion that this model of compulsory education that first took hold in America had anything to do with attendance or academics, uh, that absolutely was not the case. So uh, even before this, voluntary forms of education, home education and things of that nature, uh, history shows that enrollment or participation was somewhere around 96% before compulsory education. So it wasn't designed to address 
you know, people not being given educations or not being entitled educations, things like that. Um, and it definitely had nothing to do with uh, academics. In fact, academics was the primary objection that people in America first made to compulsory education. But they were encouraged, and this is a quote, they were encouraged to make the sacrifice of removing their children from these voluntary systems of education for the sake of the larger public experiment in the common good. So it never had anything to do with the education, the quality of education of the child. It had everything to do with the state. And so you can see that this, this model that really started with in the garden to Plato to Rousseau on through the Germany and so forth, it's, it's, really, it's really remained very consistent. Uh, among these Unitarians are names that you'll probably recognize if you're familiar with uh, the history of American education. Horace Mann, as I mentioned, was one of them. Uh, anybody heard that name? Are you all familiar with Horace Mann? Well, in case you want to know what Horace Mann felt about uh, the church, he said, what the church has been for medieval man, the public school must become for democratic and rational man. God will be replaced by the concept of the public good. That's Horace Mann. Uh, William Ellery Channing was another one of these Unitarians, and it, it, it was said of him that his venom towards traditional Christianity exceeded the Parisian mobs of the French Revolution. Um, uh, others, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was, was another one. I wish I had time to get into to some of these guys, but you know, he was somebody who was influenced by Hegel, and he was a transcendentalist. But it, it just, I mean, these guys were absolutely opposed and antagonistic towards uh, Judeo-Christian values. And these are the people who have shaped the institution that's primarily responsible for the transmission of values to children. Uh, and so, uh, but, but, but it was these men and it was Hegel that went on to influence a name that we'll probably all recognize. He's the most influential uh, figure in American education was a man named John Dewey. Are you all familiar with John Dewey? Um, he, his model for education, uh, it, it, it also had nothing to do with, with the value of education. He saw it as a radical, uh, uh, an instrument of radical social transformation. And uh, he was also adamantly opposed to Christianity. He claimed that every man is an absolute end in itself. And so we see the same theme of man is God continuing on. Uh, he was more explicit. He said, this is John Dewey. The teacher always is the prophet of the true God and the usherer in of the true kingdom of God. I couldn't, I couldn't make this up. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to deny the, the intentions and motivations of these men. Uh, he said that his vision for America was absolutely, understandably, incompatible with supernatural Christianity. He applauded the fact that, as he put it, religions in the modern world had been crowded into a corner and that the area of this corner is decreasing. That was a quote from John Dewey as well. And so his desire was to supplant Christianity with a civil religion, which in his mind was the only true religion. Is it, is it possible to deny? I mean, I, I started with the premise that uh, the fruit of the modern secular education model has proven wholly consistent with uh, the intentions of those who formulated it. Is it is it any question that that's the case when we, when we hear even from directly from these men what their motives were? Uh, Brother Ossie and Brother Howard had an exchange at the end of the last session about Pergamum. Now, I want to go back to Germany here and kind of build up to that. But as a result, largely, of the successful German model for education... Uh, Germany began to really emerge as a world empire in the, uh, the late 19th century. And that was around the time they, they started uh, having an interest in, in you know, procuring these uh, ancient works of art. And as was already said, they identified 
uh, a parallel to the emerging German Reich in Pergamum, the place where science and education would bring glory to the state. And uh, this, is the, this actually is the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. This is the room that was built. It's 210 feet wide, 120 feet long, and 60 feet high so that when people enter into the room, they can feel as though they're standing in ancient Pergamum, worshiping at the altar of Satan's throne. Um, in the 1920s, they were putting the finishing touches on this museum, and Germany had really emerged as the uh, academic and cultural apex of the world, essentially. Uh, they, their uh, educational system had been a resounding success. I mean, in, in terms of how many understand the, the goals and motives of education to be, it was all, it was all achieved in, in pre-Nazi Germany. I mean, they were the leaders in, in virtually every field. Uh, in German laboratories, modern physics was being developed by guys like Einstein and Heisenberg. Uh, in uh, philosophy, or, or sorry, psychology, German writers like Freud and Jung were, were leading the way there. Uh, Germany dominated the world of literature, uh, of theater. Uh, all of Germany was wrapped up in this kind of sense of cultural greatness. There were three or four times as many Germans that played instruments uh, as in any other country. Their literacy rates were the highest in the world. I mean, they had, they had achieved the pinnacle of what a secular educational model would hope to achieve. Uh, and in 1930, the Pergamon Museum had its grand opening. And it was that same year that a, a political party called the National Socialist German Workers' Party uh, won a resounding victory in the Reichstag and began their ascent to power. And it was two years after the opening of the Pergamon Museum that the leader of that party, uh, Adolf Hitler, would become chancellor of Germany. And so it was the most educated, the most culturally elite, the most advanced nation in the world that elected Hitler as their leader. And as was mentioned earlier, it wasn't these, this, he wasn't just popular with you know, the, these backwoods, uneducated people. It wasn't an aberration. He was actually most popular with the most educated in Germany. In fact, the, the occupation that most supported, that most voted for Hitler was educators. He was wildly popular with educators, uh, even in America. I mean, the president of Harvard was sympathetic to Hitler when he was first uh, elected, uh, all the way up to the night of broken glass. There was support all over the West for, for Hitler. Uh, now, after the war, of course, academics would kind of downplay uh, their, their influence there, but there was two German historians that put together a, a meticulously researched study called Architects of Annihilation that really chronicled how, how this happened. And uh, one of them says in their words that the nightmare of rationalism in the service of practical policymaking, which inherently tends towards the abandonment of moral restraint, found in national socialism its ideal conditions. I mean, really, if you think about it, weren't these philosophers really just waiting for a leader who would stand up and take control of this corporate embodiment of God in the form of the state and would say, we do not want any other God other than Germany itself. It is essential to have fanatical faith and hope and love in and for Germany. Is this at all inconsistent with what these philosophers had been proposing all along? It's exactly what everything had been leading towards. When a people's identity becomes completely absorbed into the state, and that state becomes the corporate embodiment and expression of God, then anything that comes against that state is coming against God. And if our identity is only as it is found within the confines of the state, then those that do not participate in the advancing of that kingdom have no value. And uh, 
So when they were faced with a, an economic crisis when, when they first went to war, they looked to the, the academics, the best and the brightest among them, to solve that problem. And these researchers say that to a very large extent, the policy of annihilation was the product of rational argument taken to a mercilessly logical conclusion. It wasn't belligerent monsters that devised this, the final solution. It was, it was these young economists and, and academics, and they, they essentially what they did, and this, this book shows it, is they devised a justification for mass murder on strictly rational economic demographic terms. And one of those economists was a man named Dr. Ralph Gator. He came up with a report for the Nazis in 1941 on the economic profitability of the Jewish quarter in Warsaw. And as part of this report, he put together all these economic formulas to determine what he coined the value of a Jew. And so he actually came up with a, what he thought was the, the, the value to the economy of a Jew. And when it became known that they really were not contributing in a positive way to the state, but were actually a drain on the state, this is what he proposed. Uh, for balancing the books, this is what he coolly proposed. A situation of undersupply could be allowed to develop without regard for the consequences. And so in terms that we would understand, what that simply means is that we could starve them to death and that that would economically be the best solution. And so that's exactly what they did. It was the basis to, on the basis of cool, rational economics that this began to happen. And a short time later, the final solution was devised on that same basis. These same economists, these same kind of formulas each one of these formulas that you see here, the end result, the sum total, is the annihilation of the Jewish people. These are actual formulas that, that these economists devised that resulted in the final solution. <clears throat> and so what conclusions can we draw from this? Are we, are we saying that every country that's that employs the German model of education is going to turn out like Nazi Germany? Well, probably not. But it's hard to deny, isn't it, that when the purpose is to deceive a people into believing in their own godhood, that when they achieve this kind of academic and cultural success, that when technology reaches this level, it becomes very easy for man to believe that he can save himself. It becomes very easy to, to imagine, to believe an illusion that there is no need for God, that really together collectively we are God. And so we can see how in this example, just like was prophesied about Pergamum, it was this academic system that ultimately led to the worshiping and the glorifying of the state, uh, even, even in committing atrocities uh, of this nature. And unfortunately, that illusion would persist in Nazi Germany until almost 80% of the Jewish population in, in Europe was destroyed. Um, if Frederick thought that Christianity was the climax of madness and insanity, it's only because he didn't live long enough to see his, what his greatest hero would, would perpetrate in his name. Um, but in reality, Frederick did, did see it in some sense because what they discovered was in the final days leading to his suicide, one of the only things adorning the wall of Hitler's uh, bunker was a portrait of his hero, Frederick the Great, father of the modern American model of education. I'm going to begin to wrap up here and I'm going to pull in some scriptures because really I hope what we're already beginning to see is that my topic has as much to do with education as it does with eschatology. And I'm actually going to talk more about eschatology, Lord willing, on Friday. But, you know, Jesus warns in Matthew 24 that 
in the end, false, prophet, false prophets and false Christs will arise, and then if it were possible, they would deceive even the elect. Paul warns about a powerful delusion that will come upon men. And, and I just want to go through some of these passages in closing in Revelation 13, and I think that they're going to ring a little bit clearer note in light of everything that we've just discussed. Maybe some, something will start to come into view here. But the apostle says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. It's hard to read that and not think about it. I mean, where was the, the place of the dragon or the serpent's throne? It was Pergamum. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as though it had been mortally wounded, but his deadly wound was healed, and the world marveled and followed after the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? So something about the identity of this first beast is a warring beast. It's a warring beast that the serpent has given his authority and his throne to. <clears throat> then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Remember it was referenced earlier that According to the Apostle John, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon, and exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and caused the earth and those to dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he performed great signs so that even he makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Brother Howard quoted David Landis earlier when he said that Never before has, have we been ready to universally accept any of the universal faiths offered for salvation, but now the religion of science and technology is being embraced without reservation. He said it was the age-old heresy of man's worship of himself. In other words, this new religion places humankind above everything called God or that is worshipped. And you'll see something about these two beasts, that we've got one that very much resembles the serpent, the dragon. It's a warring beast that we cannot make war with. But there's another one that has the appearance of a lamb and yet speaks like the dragon. And, uh, you know, when we think about what Satan's intention has been from the beginning, it, it hasn't been just to destroy mankind through a, a brute force and power, but it's been worship. And so how can we get man to worship such an ugly warring beast other than with signs and with miracles and with an enticement towards our own godhood. It talks about fire coming down from heaven. The, ac the academics and scientists that came up with it say that thermonuclear power is actually identical to the energy that illuminates the heavens. It's identical to the energy of the sun and the stars. And that as they boasted... When they unleashed that power in Trinity, New Mexico, and in Hiroshima, and in Nagasaki, it was the first time in history that that power was unleashed independent of the sun. And it was done in the sight of men. And, and, and who were the ones that... Uh, I think I skipped ahead of myself here a little bit. Who were the ones that brought that to bear? It was state-sponsored academics. And it was the same ones that came up with the miracle of the, of the computer 
for the purpose of the creation of nuclear warheads. Now, I'm not suggesting, I'm not saying specifically that you know, education itself is the false prophet or is the second, but I'm just saying that you know, there's probably a lot left that still hasn't been revealed. But it does seem like we have this beast that is identified as being a, a beast of war, of having this kind of brute force and power that's identified with Satan. But there's, there's this second beast that res, whose responsibility it is to deceive people into worshiping that beast. And so we think about all the informing institutions, all the informing agencies. Brother Howard talked about psychology as one of them. Education is certainly one of them. The media is certainly one of them. But you know, we, we, it, it begins to kind of makes sense when we see it in those terms. Uh, all, all of this, you know, what he's talked about earlier, what I'm talking about, it's all been presented uh, as this kind of harmless pursuit of the truth, uh, something that just, just means everybody well and is for the benefit of all humankind. But like the dragon, it has unleashed this human pride that has become consumed in, in worship of itself and the notion that man can save itself. And if you don't want to take that from me, then take it from one academic who boasted. Think of this in, in terms of the passages we just read. Alan Harrington said, Camouflaged by outward humility, what we call pure science serves as the arm of pure rebellion. It aspires to nothing less than supreme being. So it's not me saying it. He's saying that we're camouflaging ourselves in this lamb-like veneer, but there's something underneath that we really desire, and it's nothing less than to be exalted to the place of God. If we go on and finish that passage, he, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image to be killed. He causes all, both great, small, rich, poor, free, and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. There's a way of thinking, a way of working, uh, that's marked by this counterfeit form of knowledge that is centered in man. And he says that, he says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for that number <clears throat> is the number of a man. It's the number 666. And the scriptures tell us that the number associated with man is the number six. You know, let, let him who has wisdom understand before it's too late that this man-centered Tower of Babel project is going to come crashing to the ground. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. And everyone's going to see that all it culminated and all, all it ever amounted to was just man, man, man. It was all an illusion. It was all a deception. And yet God is wanting those of us that have wisdom to see this coming, amen, and to find our way out of these systems. Um, before I conclude, I want to just give a quick summary of everything that I've, I've covered here, but I don't want to use my own words. I'm going to use the words of uh, a famous educator. He was, a, he was part of this, the early St. Louis American education movement. Um, he was a biographer of some of these early educational figures, uh, Walt, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, he, he was a biographer of Lincoln. He was a Hegelian. He was a follower of the Unitarians. His name was Denton Snyder, okay? And see if this doesn't sum up everything that I'm saying. He says, who is the teacher? Ultimately, the Weltgeist, the world spirit, the absolute ego who is at the center of civilization and is unfolding it into a colossal image of himself. Undoubtedly, there were many te other teachers, every grade, in fact, but the world spirit is the chief pedagogue in the world school. Moreover, he has been at work from the beginning. Secretly, he had a hand in the public school and organized it for his own behoof 
training the youth of the land for his purpose. This world spirit is also at work in the university, preparing its inmates specifically for the task of his school, which is verily the sum total of all schools and in which he is finally to reveal himself. Even the teachers, while educating the youth, are themselves being educated by this supreme power in his great school, a supreme schoolmaster from whom proceeds the new idea which is to be imparted to all mankind. I haven't had time to go into the Revelation scriptures like I'd like to. I'm actually going to cover more on eschatology on Friday. But I don't think I'm making any point that's any more controversial than what came out of the horse's mouth. And fortunately for all of us, it's not just the serpent and his minions that understand the true nature and purpose of education. Moses was one who saw the need for the people of God to go on an exodus from those pagan man-centered cultures and into an entire other system that we rooted in a, a form of knowledge that was centered in the God of the universe. And he had a confrontation with Pharaoh that sounds a lot like what some modern educators even say. Just prior to the exodus, Pharaoh says to Moses, go serve the Lord your God. But who are the ones that are going? Who are you going to take with you on this exodus? And Moses says, we'll go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herd, we will go. And Pharaoh says, be careful. The Lord had better be with you if I let you and your little ones go. Watch out, for evil is on your mind. Go, but only the men among you, and serve the Lord, since that is what you desire. That sounds a little bit like these educators. And we're, we're, not, we're okay with the Christian parents. We're okay with them believing in these fables. But don't let them abuse the children. Just, just leave the children behind in Egypt. You guys can go on believing what you want to believe, but just, just leave, them, leave them here. You know, Pharaoh uh, saw something that Vladimir Lenin would go on explicitly to quote. He said, just give me four years to teach the children, and the seed that I plant will never be uprooted. And Pharaoh knew something about that too, and that's why he said, go ahead and leave them behind. But Moses refused to leave the children behind in Egypt. And when he was instructing he was reviewing the commandments with them in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to close with this. He says, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and on the frontlets between your eyes. There's, there's two marks. There's the mark of this man-centered way of knowledge and working and doing, and there's a God-centered form. And he says, when he's talking about this exodus, this exodus is going to be marked by a new way of thinking, a new way of applying your hand to things. The frontlets between your eyes, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware. Beware when some distance has, has passed between all of the blessings, between everything that God has given you. Beware when things start to settle. We get back into that routine of normalcy. Beware in those times, lest you forget that the Lord brought you out of the land of Egypt 
and from the house of bondage. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all of his household. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all of these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, and that he might preserve us alive to this day. God, help us not to forget. God, help us to remember what he's brought us out of. Amen. To remember how dependent we are on him as the source of knowledge, the source of truth. Let us not be deceived by these spirits that would try to entice us through this promise of our own godhood. Because there is coming a time when it's all going to be exposed. And in, in, in the rubble is going to be 666. Man, man, man. But the Lord is reaching out to us now and saying there's an exodus. There's a, a greater exodus we can take. And just, let's make sure that we don't remember what the Lord has brought us out of. Amen. Not leave our children behind in Egypt. Amen.